I recently replayed the first three Paper Mario games. The first two games are very beloved, but I think the third game is underappreciated and misunderstood. I'll get straight to the point and share the comment on my recent Thousand Year Door video that motivated me to make a video about Super Paper Mario. I would say that Super Paper Mario could have been one of the best. It certainly had one of the best stories, but the character designs were just far too bland for me. Like, everything was just geometric shapes. I liked the characters, but very few of their designs stuck with me. And the worst part is that I know it wasn't an intentional stylistic choice. It was because they were shackled from using original character designs by an arbitrary shift of corporate policies. I feel like we missed out on something that could have been truly magical if they'd had more creative freedom. I really disagree with this comment, but I can see why someone would think this about the game. The geometric art style of the game is very striking, and even off-putting. The original characters of the game are almost exclusively made with collections of simple shapes. As a kid, I didn't understand the significance of this art direction, but in my most recent playthrough it finally clicked. The game looks like it was drawn in MS Paint, and I mean that as a compliment. In isolation, this seems like a weird choice for the art direction, but within the greater context of the game it makes sense. Super Paper Mario is a game taking place in a computer. It helps to step back and look at the games that came before it. Paper Mario for the Nintendo 64 is clearly framed as a book. The flat characters in a 3D space is reminiscent of a pop-up book. The characters being made of paper is a product of them existing in a book, and the plot is literally shown to be taking place within a book in the opening cutscene. Its follow-up, The Thousand Year Door, still features a storybook in the opening, and the paper character gimmick that the series established itself with, but it also introduces a stage play motif. The battle scene is expanded to show everything taking place on a stage with an accompanying audience. The audience even directly affects gameplay by giving Mario star points depending on his performance. So if Paper Mario 64 is a storybook, Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door is a play. And following this pattern, Super Paper Mario is a computer. There's the aforementioned MS Paint art style, but many other iconic aspects of early 2000s computers support the computer motif as well. Tippy is a pretty clear reference to the MSN Butterfly and the Microsoft character Clippy as she looks up information that Mario asks for, similar to how internet users would use MSN. The Kragnons from Chapter 5 look very similar to Apple's Finder icon. The Pixel Race is an obvious portmanteau of Pixie and Pixel. Mario's 3D countdown bar looks just like the color bar from old MS Paint. And of course there's the mouse cursor that selects Mario every time he uses his 3D ability. These three games make up a trilogy of games that are connected by the concept of how stories can be told, in a book, through a play, and on a computer. Super Paper Mario is known as the Mario game with a story, and people are not kidding when they say that. Playing it as an adult, the narrative of this game was the best part about it. The first cutscene of the game quickly establishes its primary theme of love, with the plot being kicked off by the heinous marriage of Princess Peach and Bowser. This creates the Chaos Heart, and it's used to eventually erase all dimensions. It then becomes Mario's job to collect all of the pure hearts, which are symbols of love, to counter the power of the Chaos Heart and save all dimensions, because the love in the world is worth protecting, even if the world itself is not a perfect place. Love is a constant theme throughout the game. The main antagonist's motivation is the loss he experienced from being Romeo and Julieted. The pure hearts were created using love, and Mario often finds the pure hearts being guarded by those who have lots of love to give. The orange pure heart is held by Merlumina, whose defining feature is her long history of romantic escapades. The green pure heart is hidden in a castle and sealed away with a spell that will only reveal the heart after a, quote, powerful pulse of love and trust is released within the castle. The blue pure heart is hidden in a maze by the space queen Scorpina, who was so dedicated to protecting the world that she gave up her own child to protect the pure heart. And the white pure heart is guarded by the overseers of the afterlife, who transformed the heart into a child that they raised as their own and loved deeply, but must let her go to serve her ultimate purpose. I think that the computer motifs in the game with the themes of love is no coincidence. Super Paper Mario is a game about computers made by developers who love computers. Mario explores cyberspace with his friends, and he can find love everywhere, in the people he meets and in the places made for him to explore, and I adore that message. I even have a theory that the overseers of the white pure heart are an analogy for the developers of the game. 
The white pure heart is guarded by the two gods of the afterlife in the world of Super Paper Mario. They transformed the pure heart into a living being they called Love Bee. They doted on her for a long time, until Mario eventually came to collect the pure hearts to save the world. After some anguish among them, the overseers release Love Bee, now reverted into a pure heart, into the hands of Mario for it to serve its ultimate purpose. To me, this sounds like what the developers of the game likely went through in this game or possibly other games they worked on in the past. By combining love and magic, they created Love Bee, something that was alive and more than the sum of its parts. Eventually though, they had to hand it off to Mario to serve its ultimate purpose, even though he might not see all the love that went into it and might not appreciate it the way that the developers do. This might be my nostalgia talking, but I feel like this level of emotional depth and care put into the world of this game just isn't in other Mario games, and it's a shame that people don't appreciate this game more for that. As for the non-thematic elements of the game, there isn't much to talk about. I like what's here, there's good music, I appreciate the art style a lot after understanding its inspiration. The characters are fun, and the story is obviously great. The gameplay is the weakest aspect, but it's still okay. It's simple and not challenging at all, but no location overstays its welcome, so it's at least fun to see the new sights of each area, and it's exciting to progress the story. The only part of the game that I think is bad is its side content, which took somewhere around half my total playtime in my recent 100% playthrough of the game. I'm not even sure why the side content is in the game when there's no good rewards for doing so, and most of it is not fun. But oh well, it's not a big deal anyways since none of it is mandatory, and it's easily ignored. Overall, I like this game a lot, quite a bit more than Thousand Year Door, but that isn't saying much when looking at what I thought of that game. It's a little sad to see people disliking it just for being different, but I see where they're coming from, because I also wish the series would return to its turn-based RPG roots. That being said, this game is anything but creatively bankrupt. I see it as being even more creatively inspired than the original Paper Mario was. If you haven't played Super Paper Mario yet, I encourage you to try it out and keep an open mind about the developer's intent while playing. 